Good evening, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to see you here with uh, such a nice and big crowd. My name is Catherine Cornell, and in name of the Department of Theology here at Boston College and my colleagues in the School of Theology and Ministry, I want to welcome you to this year's Brian O'Brien and Mary Heston lecture uh, on interreligious dialogue. Thanks to a generous gift of uh, alumnus Brian O'Brien and his wife Mary Heston, every year we are able to invite a prominent figure who has done very important work in the area of interreligious dialogue. And we are very, very happy this year to welcome Professor Anantanant Rambachan to Boston College to deliver uh, the lecture for us. Professor Rambachan is uh, one of the main experts in Hinduism in the United States. Um, his specialty, for those of you who have some background in Hinduism, is in the area of Advaita Vedanta, where he has made major contributions. But he is really one of the uh, expert representatives of Hinduism who is always invited uh, to participate in dialogue and to represent Hinduism, that big tradition, in dialogue settings uh, here in the United States. Um, he was born in Trinidad, and both of his parents were Hindu priests. Um, he came to the United States, he studied, uh, obtained his PhD from the University of Leeds, uh, also obtained a degree um, in Mumbai, as well as in Trinidad. Uh, but since 1985, he has been professor at St. Olaf's College. Um, he was uh, chair for quite a long time also at the university, in fact, the first non-Christian uh, professor to uh, hold the position of chair uh, at that Christian university. Um, his publications are numerous, and I will just name a few of his uh, important books. Uh, one is called The Advaita Worldview, God, World, and Humanity, A Hindu Theology of Liberation, Not Two is Not One, Wisdom Teachings from the Hindu Ramayana uh, are just a few of the books he has published, and he has published many, many articles uh, and contributed to many dialogues. He's a regular contributor to dialogues of the World Council of Churches, He's been invited to participate in dialogues at the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue in Rome. Uh, he uh, delivered the Lambeth Lectures also in London uh, on the invitation of the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. So he is really our favorite Hindu theologian for those of you who are Christian theologians. Um, and this evening he will speak uh, on the topic of what a Hindu can learn from Christianity. And this is really uh, a topic that is of great interest to many of us because in the area of interreligious dialogue, uh, the focus is often, at least on the part of Christian theologians who are involved in dialogue, what Christianity can learn from other religious traditions. And, it's, and we're very interested to hear ones from the other side to hear what a Hindu can learn from Christianity. So please join me in welcoming Professor Rambachan to this evening. Greetings, everyone. Good evening. It is a very special honor to be invited to deliver this year's Brian O'Brien and Mary Haston Lecture in Interreligious Dialogue. I am grateful for the invitation extended to me by Boston College and personally by my friend for many years, Professor Catherine Cornell. And as some of you may know, Catherine's own work in this field of interreligious dialogue is well known and uh, appreciated and respected. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. This invitation to address you on what can a Hindu learn from Christianity is very meaningful to me since the Christian tradition has been an early and a constant presence in my life. 
This presence took a formal expression later in the mode of interreligious dialogue, but it was there early in childhood friendships on the island of Trinidad and Tobago, where I was born. In the Sunday school classes that we occasionally visited for stories and for treats, not necessarily in that <laughs> order. In a high school that I attended, which was founded by Canadian Christian Presbyterian missionaries in public festivals at Easter and Christmas, and for the past 34 years, as Catherine said, in work at a Lutheran Christian institution of higher education, St. Olaf College. Since 1981, my engagement in interreligious dialogue has focused in a special way on Hindu-Christian dialogue. I've had the privilege of a continuing relationship with the World Council of Churches, the world's broadest Christian ecumenical body, and uh, the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue at the Vatican. As part of this work, I've had the honor of meeting Pope John Paul, Pope Benedict, and uh, most recently, Pope Francis. It is especially difficult to identify the impact and significance of human relationships. And some of my friends, some of my friendships with Christians have lasted for more than four decades. I encountered the Christian tradition in a very special way through its embodiment in persons who express that faith in their way of life. And their impact on me is inevitably profound, but very difficult to describe. I remain grateful, and I express this gratitude with the words of India's Nobel Prize poet Rabindranath Tagore. And he wrote from Gitanjali, Thou hast made me known to friends who are, whom I knew not. Thou hast given me seats in homes not my own. Thou hast brought the distant near and made a brother of the stranger. I am uneasy at heart when I have to leave my accustomed shelter. I forget that there abides the old and the new, and there also thou abidest. I want to approach my topic with you this evening in a twofold manner. From the earliest historical encounters, Hindus have been learning from Christianity. So I'll begin with some of the significant Hindu leaders and teachers who acknowledge this learning from the Christian tradition and also try to identify the learning that they describe. The history of Hindu-Christian engagement on the Indian subcontinent is long and complex, and so I will be uh, selective. But secondly, I will speak in more personal terms about my own journey and learning from the Christian tradition. I did not want to deliver to you an abstract uh, lecture about possibilities for learning. I wanted to describe and share with you the reality of learning both historically and in my own journey as a Hindu scholar and practitioner. It was in the northeastern region of Bengal in the 18th and 19th centuries with the nearby port of Calcutta where the Christian tradition made its early impact in India, coinciding with the establishment of British control in the same area. Ram Mohan Roy was the founder of a Hindu reform group, the Brahmo Samaj, translated as the Society of, of God, and the first Hindu to undertake a systematic study of Christianity. In fact, he trained himself uh, in the biblical languages to read uh, Christian uh, texts. In 1820, Roy published a small work 
which is probably the first by a Hindu on the Christian tradition, called The Precepts of Jesus, The Guide to Peace and Happiness, a collection of what Ram Mohan Roy considered to be Jesus' ethical teachings. And he clarified his intention in these uh, words. I feel persuaded that by separating from other matters contained in the New Testament, the moral precepts found in that book, these will, these will be more likely to produce the desirable effect of improving the hearts and minds of men of different persuasions and degrees of understanding. This simple code of religion and morality is so admirably calculated to elevate men's ideas to high and liberal notions of God, and is also so well fitted to regulate the conduct of a human race in the discharge of their various duties to themselves and to society, that I cannot but hope the best effects from its promulgation in the present form. They did write very long sentences in those days. <laughs> Roy, who was working, as I said, to reform Hindu society, found support for this work in the ethics of Jesus. And this is where he focused his uh, learning and tried to distill from the New Testament what he saw as the principal ethical teachings. In fact, he opened up his uh, collection, not surprisingly, with uh, Matthew chapters 5 to 7, which includes, of course, the Sermon on the Mount. Keshab Chandra Sen succeeded Ram Mohan Roy as leader of the Brahmo Samaj, and he spoke extensively about Christianity and about Jesus Christ. In, but in a famous lecture, Jesus Christ, Europe and Asia, delivered in Calcutta on May 5th, 1886, Sen chastised Europeans for what he called their muscular Christianity, this expression, which caused Hindus to identify Christianity with power, privilege, and violence. And Sen claimed Jesus as an Asiatic. This was one of the very big uh, movements in his thought. He spoke of the Asiatic uh, Jesus, spoke of the congeniality of the imageries and analogies, the flora, the fauna of the Gospels to the people of Asia. But he gave prominence in his learning to Jesus' teachings about forgiveness and self-sacrifice. As he wrote, it is these two cardinal principles of Christian ethics, so utterly opposed to the wisdom of the world, and so far ex exalted above its highest conceptions of rectitude, which require to be impressed upon the European and native races, as upon the proper appreciation of these, I believe, depends the reformation of their character. Swami Vivekananda, one of the most influential Hindu teachers in recent times, and the first to teach in the West, made a special appeal for attentiveness to the teachings of Jesus. In his introduction to the Bengali translation of a small work, The Imitation of Christ, which he himself translated into Bengali, a work that is attributed to a medieval Christian monk, uh, Thomas Kempis, Vivekananda cautioned his fellow Hindus not to belittle the text because the author is a Christian. Take it seriously. This medieval Christian work fascinated uh, this Hindu monk. And it was the only text, in fact, along with the Bhagavad Gita, that he kept with him during his years of traveling around India after the death of his beloved teacher, Sri Ramakrishna. Vivekananda founded a new monastic order, the Ramakrishna Mat, and a new mission, the Ramakrishna Mission, dedicated to the renunciation and service. And I'm very honored to have one of the monks <laughs> of the Ramakrishna uh, Mat here, Swami Sarva Priyananda. Welcome. Active service in the world was not a traditional goal of Hindu monasticism. Vivekananda coined a new motto, which I have posted there, Atmano Mokshartham Jagat Hitaya 
chair, not to be taken for granted. It means for one's own salvation and for the welfare of the world. But movingly, on the night when some of the young disciples of his teacher, of his guru, Sri Ramakrishna, took monastic vows, Vivekananda turned to the life of Jesus for inspiration. As described in one account, and I'm quoting now, he told the story of, G of Jesus, beginning with the wondrous mystery of his birth, through his death, onto the resurrection. Through the eloquence of Narendra, which was his pre-monastic name, the boys were admitted into that apostolic world wherein Paul had preached the gospel of the risen Christ and spread Christianity far and wide. Naren made his plea to them to become Christ themselves, to aid in the redemption of the world, to realize God and deny themselves as Lord Jesus had done." End of quote. So at the moment of establishing one of the most important and successful orders of modern Hinduism, the founder, Swami Vivekananda, turned to the life of Jesus for inspiration. Attracted, no doubt, by the ideals of renunciation, but just as important by the ideal of service uh, to the world, exemplified in the life of Jesus. And finally, Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi turned to Jesus throughout his life for inspiration and never hesitated to acknowledge this fact. As he wrote, though I cannot claim to be a Christian in the sectarian sense, the example of Jesus' suffering is a factor in the composition of my underlying faith in nonviolence, which rules all of my actions, worldly and temporal. Jesus lived and died in vain if he did not teach us to regulate the whole of life by the eternal law of love. Gandhi's grandson, Raj Mohan Roy, described the cross, and I quote, as a magnet for Gandhi. In working to bring peace between Muslims and Hindus, Gandhi often faced the rot of fellow Hindus. The example of Jesus was a source of inspiration as he faced the anger of his own community and eventually his own death. I quote, Jesus Christ prayed to God from the cross to forgive those who had crucified him. It is my constant prayer to God that he may give me the strength to intercede even for my assassin. And it should be your prayer too that your faithful servant may be given that strength to forgive. I can multiply examples like these. It is remarkable when you step aside and think about it, that Hindus like Ram Mohan Roy, Swami Vivekananda, Mahatma Gandhi, and Keshav Chandra Sen, among others, were commending learning from Jesus and his teachings in a historical context where Christianity was virtually inseparable from colonialism and in which missionaries were denouncing the Hindu tradition as superstitious, idolatrous, and polytheistic. All of these, all of the Hindu leaders that I mention here were inspired and learned from Jesus, and this learning was reflected in the work that they did. They drank deeply from his teachings and his embodiment of the meaning of an awakening to God for our life in this world and our human relationships. They had considerable difficulties with institutionalized Christianity. And a significant part of the problem here is the alliance, the experience between the institution of the church and colonial rule. Many, in fact, used their teachings and the example of Jesus to chastise the church and what they saw as the gap between the ideals of Jesus and Christian practice. They commended and they, they contrasted Jesus' freedom from greed, his non-possessiveness, and his generous self-giving with the affluence of the church and the materialism of many Christians. Swami Vivekananda implored his Christian audience 
to return to Jesus. It's very interesting. Yours is a religion preached in the name of luxury, said Vivekananda. What an irony of fate. Reverse this if you want to live. Reverse this. It is all hypocrisy that I've heard in this country. If this nation is going to live, let it go back to him. He's speaking about the United States. You cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. All this prosperity, all this from Christ, Christ would have denied such heresies. All prosperity which comes from this mammon is transient, is only for a moment. Real permanence is in him. If you can join these two, this wonderful prosperity, with the ideal of Christ, it is well. But if you cannot, better go back to him and give this up. Better be ready to live in rags with Christ than to live in palaces without him. This is a Hindu monk <laughs> speaking to a Christian audience in the United States. Vivekananda's words are interesting for many reasons, but not the least for the fact that we find here a great Hindu teacher chastising and commending the teachers of, teachings of Jesus to his Christian audience. He's not asking them to become Hindus, but to become better Christians by returning to the source of their tradition. In a similar way, Gandhi's understanding of nonviolence, nurtured by Jain and Hindu sources, was deepened and enriched by his encounter with the te teachings of Jesus, especially the Sermon on the Mount, and his reading of Christian writers like Tolstoy. Gandhi then became one of the most important teachings, teachers for Martin Luther King Jr., who made an extraordinary claim about the significance of Gandhi's understanding of Jesus. And this is what King wrote. Gandhi was probably the first person in history to lift the love ethic of Jesus above mere interactions between individuals to a powerful and effective social force on a large scale. Love for Gandhi was a potent instrument for social and collective transformation. I wish to turn now in the second part of my lecture and to reflect on some sig salient, significant aspects of my own journey, my own learning as a Hindu from the Christian tradition and from Christian friends. Although the roots of my own learning, as I said at the beginning, are much earlier, I will begin with an event in the year 1981. Most of you were not born then. When I was a first, in the first year of my PhD program in the United Kingdom, and I got an invitation from the World Council of Churches to attend a Hindu-Christian dialogue meeting. The topic was religious resources for a just society in a small North Indian Himalayan town of Rajpur. 32 participants from various parts of the world were brought together for a week of intense and often very difficult conversation on religion and justice. Before I went to the United Kingdom for my graduate studies, I had spent three years, as Catherine said, in a Hindu monastery in India, in seminary type study. We studied Sanskrit, read sacred texts with commentaries, and practiced meditation. While immersed in traditional study and practice, I did not critically question the content of the curricula. The focus was exclusively on self-inquiry, on knowledge for the attainment of liberation that is referred to in Sanskrit as moksha. Since liberation is the highest goal of human life, this attention was appropriate. Its absence would be similar to a, let's say, a ministry curriculum in a Christian seminary that didn't talk about sin and salvation. The problem, as I saw, much clearer later was the focus on liberation in a matter, in a manner, sorry, that excluded everything else. The core claims of the tradition were expounded 
through ancient texts and commentaries with no attempt to connect and to explore the significance of these teachings for social realities. It was a very ahistorical uh, curriculum. Our teachers were not equipped or perhaps did not think it important to make these connections. We never discussed or critically interrogated texts and interpretations that justified the oppressive social hierarchies of caste and patriarchy or read the writings from marginalized groups. Our monastic teachers did not build bridges between the wisdom of the tradition and social justice. The Rajpur meeting in 1981 was my first intense participation in a discussion that brought justice to the center of religious concern. I was challenged for the first time as a young graduate student to, self, to think self-critically about my tradition, to explore its resources for a just society, and to grapple with interpretations that justify injustice. I had to look at my traditional learning through the lens of justice. This challenge and my learning from this meeting, I must confess, came more from listening to an engagement with the Christian participants who exemplified a deeper willingness to interrogate religious teaching and practice that perpetuate justice. I was able to find some of my notes from 1981, <laughs> 38 years ago. So I just want to share what I wrote at that time. On the subject of religious resources for a just society, the trend of Hindu participation with notable exceptions was an echo of the British Orientalism in the 19th century. There was a constant harking back to the past and its glorification. We did not seem to be addressing the urgent task of critically and creatively exploring tradition in the light of present realities, for there are undoubtedly vast resources of symbols and ideals in the Hindu tradition which can become a fertile source of inspiration for action directed towards the creation of a just society. It is not enough to proffer, to proffer yoga as a panacea for all forms of human injustice without being aware of the highly individualistic basis on which its philosophy and values have been traditionally understood. Certainly, if systems like yoga are to play any part in combating injustice, their values will have to be radically extended and reinterpreted. Although I cannot recall if the terms liberation theology were used by the Christian participants, I recognized later that a lot of what I heard from them were central elements of this theology. And I assume many of you are familiar with liberation theology. And for liberation theologians, religion and justice are inseparable. The interior life must find outward expression in a passion for uh, justice. And justice is not the same as charity. Charity seeks to offer relief and to care for those who are victims of injustice. Justice seeks to change and transform the structures that cause uh, suffering. So compassion and generosity were known to me as core Hindu teachings, but as personal virtues. What was new for me at Rajpur was the call that I heard from uh, Christian participants to interrogate and transform structures of justice that cause, of injustice that cause suffering. The necessity to historically connect religious teaching with life in community, and especially to address injustice and oppression within my tradition have engaged me since then as a Hindu scholar and practitioner. Since Rajpur, I have participated in numerous interreligious discussions from which I continue to learn, and these significantly influence my work. Dialogue with Christian partners and friends grappling with structures of systemic injustice in Christian communities have helped me to become aware of such structures within my own tradition and to hear the voices of the marginalized who experience the Hindu tradition as oppressive. 
On the constructive side, they help me to discern the theological resources within the Hindu tradition that I retrieve to show why we cannot be indifferent to injustice and to argue for relationships that affirm the equal dignity of every human being and that exemplify compassion and justice. So through the eyes of my Christian friends, I see better both the interpretations and practices within my tradition that are oppressive and those that have the potential to liberate from oppression. As someone said, if you know one tradition, you don't know any. Let me give you a, just a, an example to make clear how this learning works for me with one of my favorite uh, Christian texts. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this one, the famous parable of the sheep and the goats from uh, Matthew. So in this parable, Jesus commends virtuous human beings as those who engage in acts of care and service towards the suffering. These are the ones who will be richly rewarded. His words, however, intrigue his listeners since he uses the personal pronoun. As you know, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And puzzled they ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and, and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And then he comes to the heart of his teaching. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. This is one of my favorite Christian texts and one from which I continue to learn deeply. I understand this parable to affirm the divine presence in every human being. This is a teaching that is also very powerfully present in the Hindu tradition. It's only one example from the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. One who sees the Supreme God existing equally in all beings the imperishable in the perishable truly sees. But what Jesus makes powerfully clear are the implications of this truth for human relationships. The truth of divine imminence is meant to promote certain kinds of actions, feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, offering hospitality to the stranger, visiting the lonely. The love of God present equally in all is not meaningful unless it moves us to care for those who live on the margins. The extraordinary and explicit way in which Jesus spells out this connection inspires me to ponder deeply the connection between the Hindu emphasis on divine imminence and social justice. I've also taught more about religious ritual and justice inspired by this Matthew text. The most common form of Hindu worship in temples and homes, spoken of in Sanskrit as puja, involves a series of hospitality offerings to God in the form of an icon, or in Sanskrit, murti. These offerings include many of the necessities mentioned by Jesus in this Matthew parable, welcoming into one's home, food, water, clothing. Jesus' teaching intensifies the necessity for us to be mindful that the worship of God through ritual cannot be divorced from human relationships and especially our relationship with the least among us. If offering the necessities of life to, to a divine icon constitutes worship, so also is the caring for the least among us in whom God is present. In fact, the latter is even more preferable. My learning about theology and social justice is continuous. But for me, it reached a milestone in 2015 with the publication of my book, A Hindu Theology of Liberation, in which I attempted perhaps for the first time in the Hindu tradition to articulate a syst systematic Hindu theology of liberation. In the first half of this book, I outlined the theological building blocks for social justice. In subsequent chapters, I applied these building blocks 
the variety of contemporary issues that include patriarchy, homophobia, anthropocentrism, casteism, and the treatment of children. For each of these chapters, I can easily identify the dialogue meetings. Some bi-religious between Hindus and Christians, and others multi-religious that inspired my th learning, my thinking, and my writing. More recently, during the years uh, 2016 to 2018, I have had the privilege of being a Hindu participant in a series of Ethics in Action meetings at the Vatican's Academy for Sciences in Rome. In the course of two years, we covered a wide variety of topics that included poverty, peace, migration, corporate responsibility, education, climate justice, modern slavery and human trafficking, corruption, and the future of work. And although I gave presentations on each of these themes, I had no heritage of reflection within the Hindu tradition to draw from. But I benefited deeply from the history of Christian social teaching to which I was introduced in a very special way at the Vatican. The rich history of Catholic reflection on human dignity, subsidiarity, the common good, and the dignity of work taught me, provoked me, opened windows into my own tradition. Catholic social teaching is concerned with applying fundamental teachings to the challenges of life in communities, and I continue to learn from that tradition as I think and write more about the topics that we addressed in ethics for action, ethics in action. My principal conversation partners today are my friends from the Christian and other traditions who are engaged in the theology and praxis of liberation. I'm also learning from the experiences of oppressed persons within the Hindu tradition, many who have converted to Christianity and who do theology from the margins. They are also my teachers. And so I want to come now to the final part of my presentation this evening. I spoke earlier of the Hindu mode of worship that involves hospitality offerings made to God in icon or murti form. And these forms can be anthropomorphic, representing the divine in the likeness of a human male or female, uh, theriomorphic, like the divine Ganesha, or abstract, like the Shiva Linga. Each of the major god representations, Vishnu, Shiva, and the divine feminine Durga, has numerous forms as well as numerous names. In addition, many tradition, Hindu traditions, especially those that center on the worship of God as Vishnu, affirm the teaching that God periodically assumes a form and enters into our human world as an avatar, and two of the well-known avatars are Krishna and Rama. One of the key texts speaking on the nature and purpose of such a divine descent is Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, verses 7 and 10. Whenever there is a decline of righteousness and a rise of unrighteousness, then I manifest myself for the protection of the virtuous, for the destruction of evildoers, and for the establishment of righteousness, I am born from age to age. So there are three purposes there of divine descent. Protection of virtuous, destruction of evildoers, the establishment of righteousness. The many forms and names of God in the Hindu tradition testify to an infinite divine who cannot be limited to a single form or name. These forms and names speak also of the multiple ways in which we encounter the divine. Each form opens a window to see and experience some dimension of the inexhaustible divine. Each one, as we say in Sanskrit, is a darshana, a way of seeing, a way of understanding the divine. In the midst of this astonishing multiplicity of windows to God that reveal the nature of the divine, I believe that Jesus offers us a unique way of seeing. It, in its challenging difference, it is one from which we, as Hindus, must learn deeply. To put it simply,
We do not have a divine embodiment of God in the Hindu tradition who is executed in pain and humiliation on a cross and who in anguish cries out to God, why have you abandoned me? We do not have a God figure who is whipped, made to wear a crown of thorns, carry his cross, stripped to his undergarment, who thirsts and is put to death with two thieves at his side. We do not have a divine embodiment whose life does not end in victory. These radical differences led to Hindu doubts about the crucifixion itself. Swami Vivekananda, who I cited earlier, denied its reality. He said Christ was God incarnate. They could not kill him. That which was crucified was only a semblance, a mirage. The life narratives of Rama and Krishna end in victory over tyrannical rulers. Jesus' end was in humiliation. There is no divine intervention, no visible victory. To say the least, it is different. What can we learn here? The Christian tradition as a whole agrees that Jesus reveals to us the nature of God and the meaning of our, of our humanity. At the heart of this twofold revelation is love, agape. He reveals the nature of God as love and the fullness of our humanity in love. I think John puts it very beautifully and succinctly. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. This love of God is not unknown in the Hindu tradition. The Bhagavad Gita repeatedly uses the word dear, priya, to describe human beings in relation to God. Jesus is suffering, however, like a human being and for human beings, and his willingness to offer his life is an intense and powerful testimony of the passionate and personal depth and meaning of divine love that has no limits. He experienced God, the ground and source of all existence, as infinite love. And he responded with an obedient love that similarly had no boundaries and for which no sacrifice was too great. His suffering was not joyfully embraced. He prayed that he may be spared the cup of suffering and did so with an intensity that made his sweat fall like drops of blood. He experienced the anguish of feeling abandoned by God. His was an example, and this is, this is a point that I want to really um, underline, not just of non-violence, traditionally known as ahimsa in, in my tradition, the cardinal ethical principle of the Hindu tradition. His was an example not just of ahimsa, but positively of love. In fact, we may say that in the case of Jesus, Ahimsa is an outcome of love. Without love, ahimsa is only the abstention from violence. It is a virtue that is articulated in a, in a, neg in a negative uh, sense. And I think it is this revelation of love that led Gandhi, a Hindu, to say to all Hindus, yet your lives will be incomplete unless you reverently study the teachings of Jesus. So we can continue to learn from Jesus' distinctive embodiment, his prioritizing of love and its meaning for human relationships. So the Hindu tradition prioritizes ahimsa as its cardinal virtue. Jesus prioritizes love. And I think that these two can be really mutually uh, en enriching. And finally, some of the major traditions of Hinduism, I know some of you have been studying this tradition with Professor Cornell, and I can only touch on this point very briefly, so pardon me. 
Some of the major traditions of, of Hinduism characterize the human problem in the language of ignorance, or in Sanskrit, avidya. It is primarily an epistemological problem since we are not separate from the infinite being that is God by space or time. This epistemological gap, as it were, is bridged by right knowledge or jnana, through which we discover our inseparability from the divine. The emphasis, therefore, is on knowledge as, knowledge as a process occurring in the mind. Jesus reminds us that this infinite being from whom we cannot be separate is also a being of infinite love. That our overcoming of ignorance, therefore, is also an awakening not only to the unity of all things in the divine, but also to the unity of all things in love. Agape and jnana. To awaken to love is to be transformed by love and to express love in all relationships, even when it hurts. This is what we must learn. I want to conclude with one comment that I think unites the different dimensions of learning from Christianity that I sought to identify in this lecture. The Hindu tradition, as I noted earlier, shares an understanding with Christianity of the love of God, or at least the presence of God, embracing all beings. In the case of Jesus, however, this love is expressed in a very special concern. In Jesus, we see the preferential concern for those in our communities who suffer from inadequate access to life's necessities, from the abuse of power and privilege, or from social hierarchies that are exploitative and deny their dignity. These are our fellow human beings who suffer because of choices we make and structures created by us. Love requires that we strive to overcome suffering that has its roots in injustice. And I believe that this preferential concern for the marginalized, the outcasts, the powerless, is uniquely expressed in the teachings and even more in the example of Jesus. In Jesus, this becomes the measure of our religious commitment. Unfortunately, there are prominent interpretations of Hindu teachings that are summoned to justify a hierarchical ordering of human beings that has stripped millions of their dignity and of access to life's necessities. Jesus is teaching that divine love has this particular concern. While it embraces all, it has a special focus, a focus for the victims of injustice and that our love for each other must reflect this divine commitment. This is a message from which Hindus can and must learn. It is indeed, I think, the place of our greatest learning. Thank you very much. Microphone there that you need. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ramachan, for this very uh, moving and personal testimony. I think you are really in the tradition of your uh, great Hindu ancestors to also call Christians to live up to those ideals that you think. Hindus can learn from Christianity, so thank you so much for that. Um, we do have time for discussion and questions. I understand that some students may need to leave because of other activities, but please stay and uh, participate in the, in the conversation. I have a microphone for you if you have thoughts or questions that you want to engage.
Okay, the floor is open now. Thanks, Catherine. You listed a phenomenal set of topics when you were at the Vatican in your dialogues, and I'm sure most of the people in the room here would like to know what happened when you engaged in those dialogues with your Catholic counterparts? In other words, what did they learn from you, turning the equation back around, and what has resulted from those dialogues in a concrete way? For example, have we had Hindus in India today who've said we should replicate some of the things that Catholics do for social justice, especially when it comes to care for our common home, the environment, our planet? Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, question. So, uh, we, we all, we spoke to these uh, topics, uh, as, as I said, from the perspectives of our different religious traditions. So, I, I tried to, to address the topics um, from a Hindu tradition, both bringing both a self-critical, but also a constructive uh, approach to it. Um, all of these, and then um, all of the discussions were summarized and, um, and published. They are available uh, uh, at, the, at a site that, is, that, you can, that you can access. I can get the, the details for you. In terms of the practical outcome or the pragmatic outcome, I think that's a much slower process. But I do know that all of the summaries and, and, uh, and personal representations from some of, the, some of those who were present at this meeting, the fruits of our discussions were taken in a very special way to the um, United Nations. Um, because at the back of our minds uh, throughout these meetings were, and our topics were very much related to the sustainable development goals uh, 2030, we are supposed to achieve these goals. So these were taken to the United Nations and to the Secretary General as mandates from the religious uh, communities around these issues, including the issue of climate uh, justice. I, I can't, you know, give you a very specific answer into the ways in which this might inform. It's still, we just only finished the final meeting about a year ago. And uh, I think the challenge right now is the challenge of really disseminating properly the fruits of those very unique uh, meetings because through, uh, of course, there were interreligious dialogues, but I think the topics were, had, had not been uh, discussed before in that kind of interreligious uh, setting. So what was also important about those meetings, if I might just add, is that it, it was a gathering not only of theologians from the different traditions, but depending on the topic, um, the Vatican's Academy also brought people with particular expertise in the various areas. So we had people who, I mean, scientists who were working on climate justice, people who were working on human uh, trafficking, uh, and so on. So this, this made the, the, the help us to keep that dialogue, you know, on the ground, uh, especially with the involvement of, of uh, people from the field who were part of our conversation. Thanks, Catherine. Perhaps just a very quick follow-up on that, because you yourself have engaged in so many of these dialogues, yes. and you've covered such a wide range of topics. Yes. Many of the students here in the room will be aware that India is undergoing a really devastating air pollution crisis. Absolutely. We've seen the photos in New Delhi. Even worse, we've seen the smog yes. that begins to obliterate even the Taj Mahal, yes. so that it's hard, even at a short distance, to make out that yes. magnificent building. Yes. Because of your dialogues, perhaps you yourself could pick up on Laudato Si, yes. and you could say, here is what we Hindus could learn from Catholics yes. about care for our common home. It doesn't seem that it has been tried before in India, so you could be setting an extraordinary precedent. Thank I, I um, welcome that suggestion, and uh, I do try, you know, whenever I have the opportunity to speak to a Hindu, 
uh, community to bring the fruits of these deliberations. I, there is a very good possibility next year for me um, to travel and to teach in India. Uh, and I have already signaled that I would like to speak about uh, Hindu liberation uh, theology as, as part of these teachings. And I'm, this, what you have articulated is exactly what I am hoping to, to do as a single <laughs> Hindu theologian. <laughs> Um, so I'm in Professor Corneal's class, and one thing we talked about at the beginning of the semester was how if you acknowledge, I mean, there are people who acknowledge multiple religions, but sometimes what, that may weaken one's own religion by acknowledging other religions. So since you do acknowledge Jesus and Christianity, has that le um, like delegitimized your Hindu faith or weakened your faith um, at all? Or are you able to both recognize other parts of different religions while also like holding your own beliefs true? Yeah, excellent uh, question. Clearly, you know, given my own personal history that I described briefly in this lecture, I have learned and I continue to learn deeply uh, from other traditions in this very special way from the Christian uh, tradition. But I do so as a Hindu, as someone who is uh, rooted in uh, this tradition that has, you know, has nourished me and continues also to nourish me uh, very deeply. And, um, but I acknowledge in in, in, with utmost humility that um, my tradition, and I think you know, most, most traditions, because we are dealing with the divine, the infinite divine, that to claim fullness of understanding about the divine is really idolatry, it is, it is arrogance. And so I, I come with deep humility um, to the Christian tradition and to my Christian friends, deep humility and openness uh, to learning. But I think that my, my work, if I would use that, is to use this uh, learning to both, to be, to be self-critical of the oppressive structures that my own tradition has been responsible uh, for, and at the same time, to, to be the lens that helps me to discern the, the liberative dimensions of, of this tradition. So to retrieve its liberative uh, uh, dimensions and to speak out self-critically about its oppressive um, features. So I, I think, you know, the, uh, there is a more technical way of describing someone who professes a multiple religious identity, but I, I don't regard myself as professing such an, such an identity. I'm a Hindu with a commitment uh, to non-dual, the non-dual Hindu tradition, but with a, with a deep openness um, to learning from the wealth of other religious traditions, in a special way from the Christian tradition. As Gandhi said, you know, <laughs> I want to live in my home, but I don't want to live with all of the windows of my house closed. I want to, to live in a home where the windows are open and let the winds blow into my home. Let me draw from the, from the air that blows from every direction into, into my home. Can I maybe uh, ask a follow-up question? and? Uh that is, what, how have other Hindus uh, reacted to your openness to Christianity? Uh, of course, it's a big question, and Hinduism is a large tradition, but would you say that your openness towards Christianity is generally welcomed among Hindus, or is there some resistance? I think, unfortunately, um and I would have really welcomed, you know, the engagement of Swami, uh, the Ramakrishna Swami, who was 
who was here, hopefully we, I will engage uh, with him. But I think that in the contemporary Hindu world, which with the rise of Hindu nationalism, uh, as we speak of it as Hindu Twa, and uh, part of that uh, Hindu nationalism is, in fact, I would say it's a rejection of the openness of the Hindu tradition, its historical openness, its historical uh, disposition to plurality, because uh, you know Hindu Twa is a is a ideology of nationalism, Hindu nationalism that marginalizes especially um, Christians and Muslims of Hindu origin. And I think it's a, it has become a very strong and dominant um, voice, not only politically, but as far as the interpretation of the tradition is, is concerned, which makes it more difficult, I would, I would say, uh, Katrin, for for Hindus to, to be open and also to acknowledge um, such learning. And this is why in this lecture, it was not only, I didn't do it because I thought it would be politically strategic or anything. It is so important to acknowledge the history. And these are all of the figures that I have mentioned at the beginning of my lecture are not minor figures in the Hindu tradition. Vivekananda is not a minor uh, figure and the fact that on the, the day that he launched this new monastic order, he turned to the life of Jesus for inspiration is no small, is no small um, act on his part. And of course, Mahatma Gandhi, but then he was assassinated by a Hindu nationalist um, because of his, um, what they saw as his as very pro-Muslim. Yes, I think, unfortunately, it, uh, it, you know, to, to, to give a quick answer to your question, I think, we live in times when it is much more difficult to speak of interreligious learning as a Hindu and to acknowledge um, indebtedness in this, in this way. And that, that unfortunately is present not only in the Indian subcontinent, but it has now become diffused in the Indian diaspora in, in North America and in, in, in Europe. Thank you for your courage in continuing to speak up though. Hello. Um, I think that today, um, people, especially in today's political climate, there's a lot of resist resistance to have conversations with others from different religious and political backgrounds. But obviously, those conversations are very necessary. Um, what do you think is the best way to engage in conversation with others who might not be super willing to hear or respect your own political or religious view and to break down those barriers and have proactive conversations? I, I don't uh, deny the great challenges of what you are describing. I think we all recognize it and we all experience it. But I will come back again to two of the persons that I spoke about this evening. Gandhi and of course Gandhi uh, saw Jesus as a great teacher. And what Gandhi, I think, learned from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, as well as drawing from his own deep Hindu and also the Jain tradition, is that in, in love there is no space for hate. I mean, that's, that seems to be fairly obvious, but it's not always um, so obvious. And, uh, We have to learn to communicate our value, our love, for those with whom we profoundly disagree. Um, and I think very often our disagreements get translated or reaches the other as denigration of the other. And when that happens, I think it 
definitely closes the doors to communication. I'll tell you a little story about Gandhi. <laughs> when he was in South Africa leading some protests, uh, he was sent to prison by General, uh, General Smut, the South African uh, leader. When in prison, he spent some of his time uh, learning to work with leather and to make uh, leather slippers. And so he made a pair of leather slippers and sent it to General Smuts as a gift. And um, General Smuts received it and, and he used it, as he said, once every year he would wear these slippers. When Gandhi turns uh, 70 years old, he was back in India, Smuts was still alive, he sent him these slippers as a birthday gift, uh, but with a note. And he said, you know, I never said this to you, but I appreciated the fact that even as, even as you opposed me, I knew that you never hated me. And I think that, you know, the, 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 we have to overcome what the Hindu tradition speaks of as the knots of the heart. <laughs> the, the heart is knotted. And uh, when the heart is knotted, the, it, these knots are also blocked, uh, open the channels of of communication. So how can we resist? I think both Jesus and Gandhi present us with this challenge. How can we resist vigorously without, you know, without bending, but to do so with love? And that love means, you know, the openness to, to communicate. It's not easy, but I think that's the direction that I hope we can, we can, we can go to. But our, our rhetoric has degenerated so much that now we denigrate each other without thought, without thinking. It's become a habit of speaking where we, are not, we can't separate a disagreement of in, in view of political ideology from, from the denigration and uh, the stripping of the other of dignity and, 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 and self-worth. It's, this, this, it's frightening this culture of personal denigration, how far it has gone, and how much it is there, you know, the leadership of our nation um, today, how, it, how much it is erasing our humanity. So discovering, you know, discovering our oneness with the other, even the one that we oppose, is a prerequisite for the kind of communication I think I hear you speaking of. One last question. Um, so you spoke about liberation theology, and you spoke about the preferential option for the poor, yes. uh, which is clearly Christian and I yes. assume part of the Hindu liberation theology that you discussed. But I'm wondering if there are any concrete ways that you see contradictions between Hindu liberation theology and Christian liberation theology and how you work those out or how you work between those two? Contradictions between these uh, two. I think that, I'm not sure that I could point to, uh, that I would respond by speaking of contradictions because I think that, that uh, liberation theology addresses itself in a very special and significant way to identifying and transforming social structures, structures of oppression. So let me put it in this way. And this is where the learning is and perhaps where the Hindu movement has to take place. So. You know, we, as I, as I said briefly in my lecture, we, have, we speak of the 
primary human problem in the Hindu tradition is the problem of avidya, or ignorance. We're ignorance of, ignorant of you know, our connectedness with the divine. And that's a very brief summary. But that this ignorance also creates structures. That ignorance leads to greed. And, yes, and greed becomes embedded in the fabric of social uh, structures. And um, that, that, we, that, that the solution is not, cannot only be in, in terms of personal transformation. In the Hindu tradition, the focus of Hindu spirituality has been almost exclusively on personal transformation, but without addressing the social um, uh, uh, social structures, social ignorance, right? social avidya, uh, not only individual karma but social karma, how we create these, um, these structures so that, you know, you can have, so, the, so that very often the dis discourse has been upon harmony harmony among human beings, but you can speak of harmony within the larger context of very hierarchical or, or, or unjust social structures. You can, it, it, it's, it's harmony within larger structures of, of injustice. So this is where I think the radical challenge of liberation theology for the Hindu tradition um, is. And this is where I think the, um, the response, and. Sadly, and you, you can look into this, you know, in, uh, for yourselves, but when we think of some of the major issues of patriarchy, for example, or caste, most of those who are the forefront of the activism on, on these problems are not, with rare exceptions, are not grounding themselves or working from a Hindu place of meaning. They don't perhaps think that there is a place of meaning, with a liberative space within the Hindu tradition to speak about climate justice, to speak about patriarchy, to speak about, to speak about caste. Um, so they have disconnected themselves from religion and their activism. Um, that space I am trying to uh, fill to, to offer the theological ground for those who want to locate themselves in the tradition. And that's also a, a space that we need each other. That is a space for dialogue. That is a space for interreligious learning. That is a space for interreligious activism uh, also. That's where we need to meet each other and to, you know, to give our hands to each other in common, in common work. And I have, you know, Laudato Si is a beautiful, it's a very profound, I've read it um, we discussed it at the Vatican. It's a, it's a charter for, for the earth and for its future. And I wish it could be more at the center of interreligious dialogue. Thank you. <laughs>